Are you glad you're in the house today? Are you excited you came to this place? It's so good to see all of you. You look lovely from where I'm standing today. It is wonderful to, to be together with other believers, as we call in the name of Jesus Christ. In case we have visitors today, my name is Brian Moshigadi. I am born again. Jesus Christ is Lord over my life. It is the honor of my life to serve God and his people here at the DCIKZ and the Bishop Dr. Jimmy, Pastor Alice Kimani, who are not in the house today, but they are down at the main campus because of the anointing Sunday that is on today. And next Sunday, it shall be your turn. Hallelujah. Amen. So it's so good to be in this place today. Karibuni sana. Has somebody welcomed you to church? Please turn to your neighbor, look at them straight in the eye, tell them welcome to church. It's good to sit next to you. It's good to sit next to you. Hallelujah. We honor God for all the servants of God that are in this house that we serve together with. The Lord bless you and do you good. Thank you for being faithful to the work of the ministry. All right, we want to look at the anointing. Today, that's what we are looking at, the anointing. Because here we love, we love to know why we do the things we do. We don't just want to zombie into the things that we are doing. We want to understand. Recently in this service, as Pastor Richard was teaching us, he taught us, took us through praise and worship, why we lift our hands, why we kneel down, why we prostrate before the Lord, and all those things. Because the desire is that we would grow into believers who are able to give a reason for the hope that we profess. The things that we are doing, why are we doing them? In some ways, if somebody were to stop you and ask you, why are you doing this thing? Why do we lift our hands? We are able to do that. That's why every Sunday when we are sharing the Lord's table, every third Sunday, we are able to share with somebody. Somebody comes here and leads us through why are we partaking the Lord's table? Why are we sharing in communion together? What does it mean? We we, the aim of that is so that we can move together, that you're able to know why we do the things we do. So today, seeing as we have the anointing Sunday coming up next Sunday, we want to explain to all of us and just to move together. And for those of us who are already there, to remind ourselves why we anoint. What does it mean to be anointed? What does the anointing with oil look like? So that's what we're looking at today. If you're looking for a working to topic or title, it is the anointing. I'm reading from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Um, we're going to be looking at verse 1 to verse 13, and we are going to move. Kwa kasi. I'm going to skip just right along, but you please follow me um, as it comes on the screen. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse, chapter 16, sorry, from verse 1, and it says, Now the Lord had said to Samuel, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing as I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, for I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it, and he will kill me. But the Lord said to him, take a haifa uh, with you, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And the Lord continues to give Samuel instructions of what he needs to do. It comes in verse 6, he says, so it was when they came that he looked at Eliab, the son of Saul. The, the, the brother of Saul, the son of Kish, and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Verse 9, then Jesse made Shama pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Verse 10, thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these ones. And he said, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, um, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. That's the word of the Lord. Now we are looking at the anointing. That's what we want to get into. And we're going to be using Samuel um, and Saul 
and David as our case study for today. There are many other portions of scripture where we can find examples or instances of the anointing. But today, this is where we'd like to camp for just a bit. And just trying to understand the anointing. We go to the meaning of the word. When you're trying to understand something, the best way, the best way to truly understand it is to go the first time it was mentioned or to find what is the real meaning of this word. Now, the word anointing comes from a Greek word, C-H-R-I-O. Creo, C-H-R-I-O. Now, I might not know whether that is the exact, exact um, uh, pronunciation of that word. So we said in the first service, in case you're going to catch this and you're living in Greece and this is your language we are butchering, I want you to know that we are recording this live and direct from Nairobi, Kenya. In fact, closer to Kiambu County is what we said. So we have every permission to say the word however we will. But C-H-R-I-O, the pronunciation may not be very important. The meaning of the word, the, the working meaning is it means to set apart or to consecrate. To set apart or to consecrate. To set apart or to consecrate. So when you're saying anointing, we are saying to anoint something is to set apart something, is to consecrate that thing. Let's bring it closer to try and understand. Many times when we say the anointing, it sounds like a scary word. It sounds like a spiritual word. It sounds like a deep, deep thing that should only be touched by the pastors and the bishops. The anointing. But we want to use the physical to help us understand the spiritual. When we're saying to set apart or to consecrate something, we want to try and understand it. Now, I want you to look at the physical world and to look at the things that are around you. Let me explain, use the, give the example with the ladies. When the ladies are preparing themselves, when you're taking that shower in the morning, you have a towel, a white towel that you use for your body. But then from the knees downwards, you have a special towel for the knees downwards, for the feet. For your face, you have a special towel in the shower for the face only. It's even called a flannel, okay? It is for the face. Then inside the chumba, you have another small towel for your face alone to pat your face dry. The men are wondering what are we talking about. <laughs> because the towel that they use for the car is this, for cleaning the car is the same towel. <laughs> for the feet and for the hands. I, not all the men, of course. But you know, ili akupanguza meza, ikipita tu vibaya hivi kidogo iko jikoni. So the ladies might understand what it looks like to, you know, set apart something. I don't know whether you've, you've visited some people and you go to their homes and there is a special towel for the hands when you wash your hands. And that towel cannot be used to dry the dishes when you wash them. But when it is the turn for the man to do the dishes, your towel ametembea now throughout the house. Akifanya hivi, anapanguza hivi meza. Akipita hivi, hata anaona kiatu ikona uchafu, anapanguza hivi. And I mean, so that set apart, the, we might not understand that example so much. I have a towel here with me. This towel is set apart. I don't use this towel in the house for other things. I don't use it to clean or to wipe or to shower. This towel is for ministry. Hallelujah. It is my ministry <laughs> We're giving the example with Pastor Paul, who was just leading us. Pastor Paul, has, he, he uses these towels a lot. Um, because he, when you're doing ministry, Anyway, so, he, yeah, he a mantle. He calls it a mantle. Yeah? So, we make fun of it. We say, hey, leo, mekuja na una mantle. We say, ah, come on. <laughs> anyway, this, this towel for me is a set-apart towel. We've said to anoint means to set apart or to consecrate. Sindio. So this is a set apart towel. But maybe you're also struggling with that definition. Let me give you something else that we can be able to understand. Now, if there is a thing, you have many brushes in the house. There's a brush for shoes. There's a brush for your hair, if you have hair. There's a brush for the teeth. There's a special anointed set apart brush. It's called a toilet brush. sana. <laughs> Now, the toilet brush is the most set-apart brush in the house. If the president appeared today and said, I want to take tea at Mom Grace Gitu's house, and the president is outside, and the house has not yet been fagiliwa dapo sitting room, 
she would rather the president came in and found the dirt than she take the brush in the toilet to wipe the carpet in the sitting room. True or true? Regardless of the circumstance, if the president, I don't know why I'm giving the example of the president, but if the president were to come around and find Pastor Paris and just impromptu, Pastor Paris and Apigio Simon and Bia, hey, the president is right here. He's waiting outside. Now Paris has been taking care of Asha and Angel, and so she's not had time to comb her hair. She was not expecting the president or any guest for that matter. But she's told the president is outside here and he's had there's a minister, a woman of God here, and just wants to say hello. Even she'd rather go and face the president with her hair unkempt than take the toilet brush, if it's the only available brush, to comb her hair. True or true? Regardless of the circumstances, that brush is so set apart, it cannot be used for other things. Now, there's also another set apart brush in the house. It's called the toothbrush. You can use that toothbrush to do your teeth. But then I hear, I hear, I don't know, I hear. I hear there are couples who share toothbrushes. I mean... I'm, I mean, some people are like, I... But then there are some people like, Kwani, what's the matter? <laughs> anyway, to each their own, there's freedom in the house. Okay. So, um, that, that might not be very set apart. There are people who, when I am very, very stressed by something, I am one of those people, the Lord is helping me, but I am those people who, before I begin a task, I want to see at least as far out in that task as possible. I want to be able to know, nitaanza hivi, nienda hivi, nifanya hivi, nifanya hivi, nifike kule. I'm not those people who just take a leap of faith. Some of you are like that, and blessed be God, wonderful people. We are striving to be like that. Now, some of us, we want to, before I begin, kuna wale wa ututajua tukienda. Mungu wa So you just come and surprise your husband or wife. You come and tell them, tunayena Macedonia. Buwana amesema. You've already packed your bags. You're like, Alafu, like the Lord will show us the way. Some Abrahams in the house, some people of faith, go to a place that I will show you, and you just up and leave. Now your spouse is wondering, shule, watoto, uko Macedonia kuna shule, wanasoma CBC ama wanafanya American system, wanafanya, wewe utuende, mungu wa mesema. But then, there are some of us who want to sit down and we analyze, adi tunafika ile inaitangwa, analysis, paralysis. So at the end of the day, you have thought and thought and thought. You go to bed tired, not because you have worked, but because you may overthink. The Lord is, I see some people like me in the house. The Lord is helping us. The Lord is helping us. This year, the Lord has said, I will help you receive your help in Jesus' name. Now, when I cannot see the way out of a task, one of the things I do, I don't do it all the time. Blessed be God. I'm not stressed by very many things. Hallelujah. But once in a while, when I am very, very stressed, I will take one of the old toothbrushes. I will go to the toilet with it. I will kneel in that set-apart place, and I will start to scrub the toilet, the toilet bowl, and I will scrub the toilet bowl. Once in a while, I don't do it every time. Some of you are already cringing. You're like, oh my God. But I, I do it, and I'm getting into the in places of the toilet bowl, Coco. I am speaking to myself. I am, I am talking. I am having a board meeting. Moshigadi, you know, me, myself, and I. Nikoko tu, nina scrub, nina scrub. By the time I'm leaving that place, it is good therapy. Now, that toothbrush is not very set apart because it can do many things. But the toilet brush, ladies and gentlemen, is an anointed tool in your house. I know you are struggling to understand anointing toilet brush. We have already said the meaning of that word is to set apart or to consecrate. So the most set apart thing in your house is the toilet brush. You cannot use it for anything else. In my years of living, I have never seen the toilet brush being used for anything other than the toilet. You don't use the toilet brush for sweeping. You don't use it for combing hair. You don't use it for polishing your shoes. In fact, you don't, you don't even take it out of the toilet. It stays there. Its only enemy is wear and tear. Ikiisha, unaitoa, you anoint another one. You put it inside there. Now, if you have that image of the toilet brush and how set apart it is, then you can understand what the anointing is. It is set apartness. In other words, regardless of the circumstances that come, whether it is the president or the king or your children or your spouse, regardless of whatever, you will not take this thing out of its set apart place to go and do things that it has not been set apart for. So in the same thing, when you have been anointed in your life, it doesn't matter what circumstances you face. You stick in the place that the Lord has called you to be. 
and the believer is anointed with the Holy Spirit. Now, we have been given, the Bible says when Jesus is speaking to the disciples, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he says, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In other words, when you have been anointed with the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power to do what? To be witnesses to me. You shall be my witnesses. So what are you being set apart to do? Because you've been anointed for something. When you're anointed with the Holy Spirit as a believer, you're anointed to do one thing. Your place of consecration is to be a witness. Now, whether I'm not saying anointed to be a pastor or a teacher or a preacher, no. Anointed to be a witness. You see, witnessing is the thing you can do anywhere. You are an accountant who is a believer. You are a witness. You are a doctor who is a believer. You are a witness. You are a pastor who is a believer. You are a witness. You are a student who is a believer. You are a witness. You are working somewhere in customer service. You are a believer. You are a witness. You have been anointed to be a witness. You have been set apart to be a witness. You are the set apart ones, in fact. The ones who have been called out, the Bible says, 1 Peter 2 and 9. Do you have been called out to be the royal priesthood chosen generation, holy, God's holy nation? And what is the assignment you've been given? What have you been set apart to do? To tell the works of him who has called us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, to be witnesses. Hallelujah. So when you are a believer and you have been anointed, every time you are being reminded, you have been set apart. You can no longer talk like this. You can no longer dress like this. You can no longer do like this. You can no longer be like this. You can no longer respond like this. You are set apart. The same, same power. That works, or principle, that works for the toilet brush. The same principle works for you. You don't go out of your place of anointing. And our place for anointing is to be witnesses. Hallelujah. Amen. Tap to your neighbor. Turn, tap, tap your neighbor. Tap your neighbor. Just tell them, neighbor. You are set apart. Set apart. The very same principle. When you think about the way the toilet brush does not live to go and do other things that it has not been assigned to do, you think you also cannot live to do things that are not for believers. People who have been anointed need to stay in the place where they have been called into. The place of witnessing. And we've already looked at what it looks like to be a witness. To be a witness is not just to talk. We're also witness with our activities, with our actions. We witness with our actions, the way we are. People will be able to tell us apart by our fruit. When people see the way we are walking around, they can tell these ones are believers. When the disciples were first called um, Christians in Antioch, it was because they were Christ-like. These ones were, they were giving a witness of Jesus Christ. Not just by the way they spoke, but by the way they were moving, by the way they were, they were acting. They loved like Jesus. They talked like Jesus. They fellowshiped with one another like Jesus. Their dealings were like Jesus. People look at them and they say, these ones, these ones are giving witness. These ones look like Jesus. Tell your neighbor anointed. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're looking at that is what it means to be set apart. That is what it looks like to be any wewe umetengwa ufanye kazi hii ambayo mungu amekuita. And that, even without doing, you are a being. You are, that is your state. You are a witness. That's who you are. It's not just about actions or words. That even when you're seated like that, you're seated like a witness. I love Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 in the, in the message paraphrase. He says, so here is what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life in the message. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're eating, you're sleeping, you're going to work, you're eating, and place it before God as an offering. That is what being a witness looks like. You take your everyday, ordinary life. You're eating, you're sleeping, you're being, you're going to work, you're walking around life. You place it before God as an offering. That is what being witness looks like. Bwana Yesu asifiwe sana. I look at the example of um, David in 1 Samuel chapter 16, which we just read. Now, David, here we find him being anointed as king. Now, the reason why David is being anointed as king is because people have asked the nation of Israel, by this time, have already been delivered, broken out of Egypt, they have been brought into this land, and now they have dwelt there for a bit, they have seen what their neighboring countries, or neighboring nations rather, um, look like. They all have kings. 
And see, the thing about having a king or having a leader is that it's, it, it's giving, it gives wealth, it gives pomp and color. It's a nice display. Remember when the president was coming here? Are you here? Do you see the way the place was being prepared? Did, yeah, we, I mean, Mali it will go to make us as an parking lot. Lakini siku hiyo, yeah, it's not like he can't come here. If the president came here, si bado ataabudu. He will not die if he came to a place like this. But because of the, the office of the president, we have to do some extra things. Now, if you have looked at how the royal family in... Is it in, in the UK? That's <laughs> what so I was trying to remember. If you look at the royal family in the UK, they've been there for a long time. The way they, they carry themselves... In fact, one of them even moved away because they were like the institution, the way it functions, the institutions. You know, we are not mentioning names because, you know, we're, but it, it, it's carried in a meticulous way. I remember when they were celebrating, I don't know what jubilee celebrations they were celebrating for the queen before she passed on. I don't know how many years she had been. How many years was it? 75? I think. You know, these things are on YouTube. You can find them. And they were preparing. I remember CNN and all these other places were doing features on the meticulous nature of the preparations that were happening for that celebration, for the dinner, for the balls, for the royal ball. I mean, listen to it, people. It's giving wealth. Okay? My sister says it, it's giving opulence. <laughs> In that feature, they would show, I'm not kidding, guys. It is true. They would show meza, glasses in mepangwa kwa meza, and somebody would take a ruler, ruler, ladies and gentlemen, to measure the distance between the edge of the table and the tip of the wine glass, of the flute, sorry, of the flute. They, they measure this distance, and they make sure that this distance is exactly the same as this distance on this edge. It's meticulous. It's giving a beautiful display of order. It's the order you would like your children to have in their house, but... <laughs> the Lord shall remember you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just wow. You've seen the royal weddings, how they prepare. I mean, nothing goes... Not a single flower is wilted. Every single rose is in place, pristine roses or carnations, or whatever flowers that they're going to be using, gardenias. <laughs> so when you think about that example of royalty, ladies and gentlemen, you are not confused as to why Israel wanted a king. Because them, their leader was God in his holy place in heaven. They were looking like they are getting a road deal. So the other nations, in their national celebrations, there's a bigger race. Do you remember when we have, um, okay, even now they're there, but we used to be more involved when we were kids. When we had national celebrations, and there's a big display. And you see, we're like, we have those kinds of jets in Kenya. They're ours. Atujaomba mahali. Then you see there are some big tankers that are just marching across Zinainke because some big jungle green tankers. We're like, ha, we have those. Those are ours. They've only been broken out for this glorious display on the day, the national day. Now, Israel didn't have that. Israel just had feasts unto the Lord. You're like, just feasts, guys. Animals. They're just, there's not much. But the neighboring nations, they put on a display. When Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church and says to them, now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph and leads us from one in one glorious victory parade or in a triumphant victory parade. The example that Paul is using there is mostly of the Greek and how they used to do the things. The glorious display was beautiful. When a king went out to battle and they came in, the king that had been captured in that other nation and all his subjects would be made to march in front. And then all the spoils of war that they got would be put in a display behind them. And then Ukonyuma, the commanders and the armies in their beautiful uniforms and the people, the trumpeters are going around the city marching it was beautiful. Israel did not have that. So they're looking around, they're like, we, we want a king. We want a king. People are trying to explain to them, guys, it is better to have God as king. It is better. 
I promise. I like, say what you want. Me, I want a king. Now some of you have children, and they are in the age where they have learned to ask for things. And they are asking for something. You, you are telling them there is food in the house. Then they don't want that you are rice in the house. They just don't have the right language to tell you your food does not taste as good as you think it does. No offense. They love you, but they want to eat this one in a supermarket. But they can't tell you that. So they are throwing themselves on the floor. Tantrums. A lot like Israel. So God heard. And God said, it's okay. I have heard you guys. You guys have rejected me. It's fine. I'm still going to give you something. God selects for them a king for them. When God is anointing that king, sending Samuel to anoint this king, says to them, you're going to anoint a king for their people. Not for me. For their people. And Saul is selected. Now, Saul was not a bad man. Saul was a good pick. Saul, the Bible says, was handsome. I don't know why the Bible would include that detail. But Saul was a handsome king. Saul was a head taller than all of Israel. Likely not that he physically, literally, but he was noticeable. He came from a wealthy family. The Bible says in um, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, that his father Kish was a mighty man of power. He came from a good background. Saul was a good man. When Saul is being approached by Samuel and being told, I want to, uh, you, you're going to do this thing, the Lord has chosen you, he says, me, me, I am from the least tribe, Benjamites. And in that Benjamites, my family is the smallest. Well, that is highly likely not here or there because we've just said his father was a mighty man of power. But anyway, in his own humility, he's, I know, I, mm, Mm -mm. But then he takes the job anyway. And the Lord says, this is the king. He's going to lead you guys to defeat your enemies. And Saul did defeat many enemies. He did defeat many enemies. But towards the end of his journey, well, he broke rules here and there. But he was consistent in the breaking of, in his disobedience. He was consistent with it. Towards the end, the Lord sends him to the king Agag, and when he goes out, this is just a quick overview, you can find that story, First Samuel chapter um, 15, I think. As you go into it, you find that he's been sent by God, and they've been told, go out there, I'm going to give you victory. When you find there, wipe everything clean, clear the whole place, kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep and camel and donkey, clear the whole place, level it down, raise it to the ground. Now, Saul has been, by this time, he's been king for a bit. It's not his first rodeo. He's been king uh, for a year or two, or thereabout. He's been king, wait, wait. So by now, he's not the timid guy. He was saying, me, I, me, I, I cannot be king. Me, I'm from a small family. Now he's already known the trappings of power. Now he's already enjoyed. He knows what it's like to be king. By the way, even when, the, when they were, you'll find it, Uko, in the beginning, I think from chapter 10, 11, You'll find that because they had never had a king before, Samuel even had to explain to them what the ninis of royalty look like. They didn't even know. They were asking for something. Sasa hata wana constitution. Ha Samuel ndiyo anambia royalty anatritio hivi. Kunaenda hivi. Kunaenda hivi. Like, you can see them establishing. It's an interesting story. Please go and look at it. Because of time, we'll not get into all of it. But, um, so, Saul is there, and by, by this time, he has already amesha zoya. So he decides to make an executive decision, because that's what kings do. I know what God has said, but I'm the king. So we are going to spare these animals. I, I don't think God was... I don't, I, I'm not sure whether God was... I, I don't think he meant the, what he's saying. We can use these animals instead of letting them go to waste. Perfectly good animals. Let's use them for the sacrifice. And then let's bring the king also so that he can be our captive. It is such a show of might and power. Yeah? So that's what he does. But the instruction of God we've just read before was I want you to raise the place to the ground. See to me on evil. So he's already started having things in his heart. Now because the disobedience is consistent and he's, he's really unapologetic, his heart is unfazed, God rejects him as king. So that leads us into now where God has rejected him as king. Rejects him in front of Samuel. Now Samuel, because this was his project really, God had picked him from just there and walked with him now, he cries, he cries, he regrets. But then the Lord calls him out of his place of mourning. I says to him at the beginning of verse, chapter 16, why, how long are you going to mourn for this guy? I've already rejected him. In fact, I even have a king for myself. Now, notice the language here. At the beginning of the introduction of Saul, 
in chapter 10, there is not a single mention of God. It's a mention of Saul, it's a mention of his family, it's a mention of his physique. But by the time we are coming to the place of the mention of David, in fact, David is not even mentioned himself. David is introduced to the story, I think, much later, verse 13 of chapter 16. His name is mentioned officially the first time there. But as we continue to read the story of David, we continue now, to, we can go back and say, this David at that time was truly the man after God's own heart. While he was tending to the small mundane activities and, and things, while he was tending to his father's sheep and going out as a shepherd, there was something that was happening. He was building a relationship. Now, a lot of the Psalms, not all the Psalms have been written by David, but a lot of them have been. Actually, most of them have been penned by David. A lot of them he wrote while he was out there in the wilderness. While he's out there just... Because I don't know whether you guys... Okay, this is not the youth service, so maybe you guys have a bit of uh, <laughs> experience. on the same. Using that example in the youth service was a bit difficult. Um, some of you here have had the experience of looking after goats and cattle. Sindio, I hear a couple of yeses. The youth service, we have the experience of eating the cows and goats and <laughs> cattle. Anyway, you know that that activity is not a very interesting activity. Because you go to a wide opening and you just release the animals to graze. When they are grazing, you can't talk with them. They are not problematic. They are just grazing. They are just moving. In end two, in end two, in end two, in end two. Then when it's a time that they will need to sit down, they will sit down and start to ruminate. They are chewing cud. You are so left out in that process, you cannot participate. So for hours, na ulitoka asubuhi mtarudi ile masaa ingine. For hours, you just seated there. You have to create things. There wasn't social media in those days. There wasn't much to do. So what did he have to do? To look, I challenge you to go through the Psalms. He sits down and he looks around, sees the skies, and he sees the vastness of it all. It's like, oh, Lord, my God. I mean, I consider the work of your hands. The morning tells Siju to the day, Siju to the night, Psalm 19. I mean, he's looking around and he's like, this God is great. Ha! Ah. He looks at how he's relating with the animals. He's like, ah! What I am doing to these animals... God is doing to me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He looks around and he sees all this greatness that has been created by God. He pauses and he's like, ah, who am I that you are mindful of me? I mean, he goes on a trip. Now you see where the Psalms were coming from. They came from a lot of time, with, uh, from someone who had a lot of time on his hands. But he decided to use it with God. Yeah? So right there we can see the heart of David. When the Lord is picking him to come in, to anoint him, to set him apart, to be a king unto his people, to do the thing, to win victories and to lead his people into a glorious end, the Lord is picking somebody whose heart is right. So those are the two stark examples that we have. We have the contrast between Saul and and between David. Now, we are readers of the Bible. You and I have read the Bible. We've gone through here and there. We know, did David make mistakes or did he not? He did make many mistakes. In fact, if we were to read the story of David, because we have more detail, I think, of the life of David as opposed to the life of Paul, we would find that he made many mistakes more than Saul. Yet, it was David that God called a man after my own heart. It begs the question, what was different? It's not that the person who was anointed by God was a perfect man, not at all, but there was something, there was something about this man, and it brought me to the one enemy of the anointing. The one enemy of the anointing is disobedience. Now, not just disobedience, consistent disobedience, and consistent disobedience, in another word, we call pride. A heart that is unwilling to yield. A heart that is unwilling to be broken. David alifambul maranyingi. But many times he would go back to the place of God and said, against you alone have I sinned. I will not conceal, if I conceal my, my sin within me, I will be consumed and destroyed. So he goes and lays himself bare before the Lord. There was no pride in this heart. He reminds us after he had fallen with Bathsheba in Psalm 51 verse 10, which is really common. He says, 
a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Makes the song of create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. Now when he's writing this, he's not in the place where he has come from 40 days of prayer and fasting, seeking the face of the Lord in earnest. He's come from a place of sin where he's been called out by the prophet, is it Nathan? Calls him out. And when he realizes, he's like, oh, 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 cast me not away from your presence, O oh Lord. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Now, this is a heart that has refused to stay in the place of disobedience. Because the one enemy of the anointing, ladies and gentlemen, is pride. It is continuous, sustained disobedience that I have I've messed up, and instead of, messing, of picking myself up and going back to God, I decide... Now I'm a big boy. I mean, I'm a young believer. Now I know how to navigate. I can just do this thing, and then I'm just going to ask for forgiveness, and I know how God is. God, you're kind, and you're abounding in love and mercy. I mean, that is telling of the heart that is filled with pride. David's heart was not a heart of sustained disobedience. That every time you realize that I have fallen, that I'm realizing this thing is the enemy of my anointing. I have been set apart for something. So I, I have removed myself from the set apart place that the Lord has ordained for me. What do I do? The response is to go back to that place. Not to continue staying in that place and creating new rules for it. I am not looking to defend my sin or defend the abuse of my consecration. I'm not seeking to defend it or to legalize it or to justify it. I'm looking to own it up and say, Lord, help me. So the anointing, the one enemy of the anointing, throughout scripture you will find all the people that have been anointed, set apart by God, is this one thing, the sustained disobedience, which we are calling today pride. Now, it's important for us, then, in looking at what the anointing is like, to think, for instance, with a very present example that we have anointing that's coming on this, that, um, that is coming up this coming Sunday, to think this, together with the anointing and set apartness, this, we've talked about the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus spoke about in Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 8. Then we think about the anointing with oil, which is very common to what it is that we do. The anointing with oil. Now, the oil that we use to anoint... Here is this one. You can use whatever oil you want to use in your house. But this is the oil that we're using here. Now, there's nothing special about this brand. In fact, some of you have this very brand in your own kitchens. True or true? Now, if you don't know how to cook and you come and we chote add for you this one, you go and cook, your food will not autom automatically taste good just because it has come from church. Yeah, to an example. I can hear the chefs in the house are just laughing. But this, 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 this is, first of all, this oil is expensive, okay? Because it is pure, they call it extra virgin olive oil. Now, it's pure, it's giving purity, okay? So, one of the reasons why we pick it from the shelves. Maybe you're asking yourself, this is a practical lesson, okay? Maybe you're asking yourself, You see, sometimes we just want to be very deep in the house of God. Why that specific one? There has to be a reason. Now, if you don't have money, if you're in a season where you don't have money and you want to anoint your children in the house, and then you go to the shelf and you don't find this one, will you not anoint them? I mean, I'm going to save until I find Pietro Coricelli. <laughs> no, pick whatever oil and pray over it. Just ask the Lord, Lord, I dedicate this one to you. It shall be used in Jesus' name. Why? Because this oil is just a symbol. Hallelujah. It is just a symbol. It is, it is not special. It is not divine. <laughs> Let me give an example. Maybe it will help us understand that story easier. I remember there's some day in church at the main campus many years ago. Um, at the main campus, there's a time we had, oh, sorry, there's a time we had a service, and um, I think it was Bishop Mark who had come to minister. I'm not too, too sure. But he used, he was teaching about, I think he taught about the anointing um, and consecration and so on and so forth. And he asked for a rock, Maui, Jiwe. And a rock was brought into the house. Those days, the church did not have a carpet. It was tiles. It was easier to clean. And he put the rock there. And he was giving the example of how, um, was it Samuel, uh, took a rock and just between Mizpah and Shen, and he anointed it with oil, saying, that's far, Ebenezer. And he took the anointing oil, and he poured it on that rock. And he was, I think he was talking about setting up an altar. I think that was it. And he anointed that rock. And he spoke and he spoke. He was just giving an example. 
And then it was time for ministry. And people came and they were prayed for. And it was time for, I mean, giving. And people gave and so on and so forth. You see, people are coming and going and coming and going. When you were to Nachuka communion. By the time people were finishing, when the ashes are coming to look for the rock, so they can take it outside, the rock was not there. Somebody threw it inside their bag and went with it home. Because this rock has been anointed. This is a special rock. Now, please, spare our anointing oil. Just, the oil is just a symbol. Tell your neighbor, neighbor. It is just a symbol. If you're struggling to understand the symbol, let me use this symbol here. This brown thing is what? It is a cross. I hear some people saying gypsum. Those of you who are very meticulous. It is true, it is gypsum. But it is a cross, okay? It is the symbol of a cross. Every time you see this, at Shiloh, at the main campus, in Muemuto, in Kaharate, in Bondo, in Alego, in Spain, in wherever in the world. It is telling of something that happened more than 2,000 years ago. It is talking about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ at that cross. That he gave so that you and I might not die, but might have everlasting life if we believe and receive that sacrifice. The cross is a symbol. Now, I could write all those words on a banner and put it somewhere outside. But instead of using all those words, I just create something like this. And anywhere in the world where this symbol can be seen, it is communicating those many words in just a short way. One is here. That's the thing about a symbol. If you see this one in mathematics, it is not talking about religion. Sindio, it is? It is a plus, near addition. It is a symbol. Now, it could, I could explain to you how it is taking one number and another number and putting them together so that in the very end effect, it could be the sum total of this number that you've taken and this other one. But instead of doing that, exam papers would always be full if I had to explain all those things. But we just put the symbol, plus, to metoka apple. So when we are using the oil, it is just a symbol. Now, why do you need a symbol? Because many times, our life this is spiritual. By faith is how we are living. The Bible says the just shall live. So when you've come into the service and Pastor Wangombe has anointed you here with oil as he's praying with you in the ministry team, as by the action of the Holy Spirit, he just decides he's going to use some oil as an outward symbol. Now when you go home, highly likely you might find that the spouse you are praying about or the child you are praying about is still in that same house the way you left them, in the physical. But in the spiritual, he is not the same. They are not the same. Why? Because we know that the fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. So things in the spiritual are not the same. I am one of those believers who know with everything I have that prayer has mighty power in his working. So things cannot be the same. Every time I am praying, something has shifted. It might not be apparent in my physical life, but in the spiritual, I know something has moved. So the symbol then comes into play. That when I have gone home, even though I am looking and things look exactly the way I left them, when I go to my bank account after I have left, and I have been told here, receive the anointing for multiplied wealth and multiple streams of income in the name of of Jesus. Nina teremka pale cooperative kwa bank yangu. Kwa ukuta pale naangalia balance. Ninaona we? Pale niliacha hata kulikuwa na overdraft bado iko tu hivyo. Does that mean nothing has happened? I can remember when I am in doubt because of what is happening around me. There was an outward symbol. There was oil that was used on me. Something happened. Ah. Bona sifiwe. That is why we use oil to anoint us. It is a reminder. You see, next Sunday is going to be the 25th. Now, throughout your year, you can always refer to that date and say, something has still not happened in the physical, but I know that God is doing something. Because on the 25th of February, in this year of threshing the mountains, I received the anointing to thresh every mountain. Tell your neighbor it is an outward sign. The outward sign is just for you to remember. Now, let me settle. Our time is almost up. Let me settle somebody that is wondering. Now, when I am anointed, should I wipe it off or should I go with it until it naturally ends? I'm on a patana na mimi after ni mefanya anointing, ni meanointi wana bishop, ni kiketi chini, unanipata ni kipanguza, unanambia, wacha, 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 unapanguza. Si wacha, ni na mtu wapanguza mafuta. 
It is just an outward sign. The most important thing is what you're believing in your heart. So it's not about the oil, it's not about the brand, it's not about how long I let it sit. It will just be absorbed into my skin. Well, your skin might glow because it is olive oil. It maybe has its own benefits, but I mean... Or again, your skin might break out because maybe your skin is sensitive. <laughs> but the important thing is in your heart, there's a, there's, this is just an outward symbol of a deeper thing that is happening, that God is working. God is working a deeper work inside of our lives. So then... Knowing these things, why will it be important for me to desire the anointing? What are the benefits of the anointing? Because some of us require to have good reasons. Why should I receive the anointing? First of all, just in its, we have already said the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God, even with oil, the anointing is to set something apart. The Lord is setting you apart for something. When we are saying this is the anointing for, we are giving it a reason. We are saying this is the purpose for the anointing. When we say this anointing is the anointing for threshing mountains, we are saying I am being set apart this year to thresh mountains. Bonnet to you. Now, if I am not set apart, therefore, it means I can be used for anything. Quelly, see, quelly. Yeah, I can be used for anything. If I am not set apart, the opposite of that is that I am common. <laughs> it's just I can be used for anything. We have given the example of a, tooth, of a tooth toilet brush. Set apart, anointed instrument in your house. I'm sure after this you will see it differently when you go back to your house. You wow, this anointed tool. You know what is not anointed in your house? It is it because it is not set apart, it can be used for anything. Kikombe ayoga to watu wa Mungu. Uliitoa dukani kwa sababu ya ukaingia nayo kwa nyumba. Ulimalizia yoga kwa matatu. Lakini huko itupa. Because you have good plans for that cup. Plans for good and not for evil. You will give it a future and a hope. Kwa sababu ujamalizana na yoga tile iko uko chini, sindio? Uko na kazi ya kuchovia, kazi kuu. Amba, hata ila kakifuniko ile ya kafoil. Mnatu yu kafoil? Kwa sababu, you don't want to look like, a, an, like an unschooled person in the matatu. Mtu mwenye shima zake kwenye suti, jamani nimeketi na yoga. Mnanipana, apana. So, sita ilamba. Sita itupa. Watu wanafikiria, such an environmentally conscious young man. It, it's not that. I have good plans for it. I am sitting it in my bag. Niko hivi kwa bag. If your children come to meet you at the door, anaangalia bag yako, umetuletea nini ma'am? Aiangalia ona hii nitakataka atupe. You know there's a war there. Ma niliwakataza kuingia bag yangu kutoa vitu zangu za maana kuzitupa na jua huko umemalizana na yeye anaona yoga timeisha but kweli haijaisha. Now when you are done with that yogurt, after umeifanyia jeans upendavyo. Jeans utakavyo. You will wash it. Well, maybe, I don't know about the people who have families, but for the single people, you hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ukimaliza nayo, unayosha, alafu sasa inakuwa ni nini? It is part of your... Eh, hey, ni tambla, thank you. Imekuwa tambla sasa kwenye nyumba. Ukingia hapo, unaeka tu maji, na inabeba maji ile kiwango unataka, sindio? Hii tutu glass to dogu, unapiga hivi ni kama... You know, just... No, just inabeba what you want. It was intended for what when it was coming from the factory? But now it is serving you? Just a clear, colorless, tasteless liquid, water. You will not give it to your guests. But after you have used it for some time, umeyosha, 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 imefade. Atujui kani Mount Kenya, ni ilara, ni fresha. Tunaona tu iko na A, muisho. So atujui ilikuwa uku muisho. Like, so imefade. Unaona hiki tu ni aibu kwa nyumba yangu. Ikiwa kitchen. Unaitupa. Unaichukua, unaipeleka, bathroom. Unayekea nini? Bas, kanisa ndo ili, unaeka toothbrush huko ndani, unaitumia huko, unaitumia, unaona, ai sasa kule chini, inakaa sasa, it's giving dirt, it's giving bacteria, it's giving infection. So unaitoa, unaona, this perfectly good cup, unaikata nusu, unaipeleka jikoni tena, unayekea nini? Unayekea sabuni ndo hiyo sasa. Unaitumia jikoni, unatumia jikoni. Unaona sasa hata mali uliku unayeka sabuni. Sasa, hata ukiitumia na stilwa ya ukieka stilwa hapo inakuwa brown. 
unaona hii inaniharibia so unaitoa you start your plant mom plant dad journey unaweka mchanga kidogo na tumaji unapanda hapo weka maua alafu unaweka kwa dirisha imekuwa vase ama ni vase si imetumika when the manufacturers hear what you are doing with their cup they know that was not the intention of the cup but you have used it now this thing was not set apart it is not consecrated you have used it and moved it from one room of the house to the other you have used it to do whatever you want to do with it and there is nothing wrong with that i'm just trying to say if something is not set apart it is common it will be abused misused overused or in some very rare cases underused if you are not anointed if you do not submit yourself to the anointing of god then anybody around you can misuse you overuse you abuse you or in the very rare cases they will underuse you some of you have great skills and gifts in the house of god they are not being used because you have not allowed the lord to set you apart so your skills are going to waste you're saying oh but me an accountant how can those skills be used in the house of god just allow the lord si ukubali aku anoint kubali tu the anointing of the holy spirit alafu uone ujue mahali manini zako zinaweza zikatumia some of you are saying oh but me you know nilifanya project management nilifanya sijui construction management nikiwa shule so i don't know how they are going to use that in church allow the lord to consecrate you and then pastor gedai will show you how your skills can be used for the kingdom because when you've been set apart you are doing exactly what you have been set apart to do bwana yesu asifiwe so the benefit of the anointing is that it keeps you exactly where you're supposed to be Let's finish quickly. Another benefit of the anointing is empowerment. We've already talked about it. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now when you are anointed, you are empowered to do something. For the disciples, they were told you shall be empowered to be witnesses to me. When you are anointed for threshing mountains, you are empowered to thresh the mountains. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. You need the anointing. Tell your neighbor you need the anointing. Another benefit of the anointing is fruitfulness ladies and gentlemen. Now God sets apart a human being called Adam. Sets apart another human being called Eve. He tells them Genesis 1:28 be fruitful, multiply, subdue, have dominion. He gives to them because they have been set apart to be the family or to be the beginners of the family. He sets them apart to be fruitful. When you are set apart or anointed, it its natural effect is fruitfulness. Now when you say fruitful some of you might struggle with the word it's not just fruitful at kuzama matunda ya mti it is effectiveness when something is effective we can say it is fruitful in its venture in other words when something is fruitful it does the thing it's supposed to do let's go back to our anointed tool in the house the toilet brush when you are using the toilet brush you don't use it for fun in fact you don't use it every day kweli si kweli you use it when you're cleaning when you're trying to remove the things <laughs> inside the bowl right so when how do you say that the toilet brush is useful or is it is fruitful when it has left the toilet clean sinikweli now you will be surprised there are companies whose main job and purpose is to sit down and to work hard to design the improvement of the toilet brush to how does it curve If we add a curvature here of 5 degrees it will be able to go into the toilet like this. So you've seen toilet brushes of all toilet brushes of all kinds of all angles and shapes. It is people who are sitting down and they are deciding we want to make sure nikieka hivi it has covered everything it we are trying to make sure it is fruitful. Now they are forming this thing working on this thing until it is fruitful or it is effective. The benefit of the anointing is that it makes you fruitful if you're struggling with fruitfulness if you're struggling with being effective at your place of work in your family at home consider the anointing ask the lord to anoint you with his holy spirit ask the lord to allow you to be set apart consecrated for something then you will receive fruitfulness bwana yesu asifiwe the anointing destroys the yoke that's another benefit the bible says concerning the anointing in isaiah chapter 10 verse 27 it says and in that day the yoke shall be removed from off your neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing in the new king james it says because of the anointing oil the anointing destroys the yoke 
There is no yoke that can stand against the anointing of the Holy Spirit. None whatsoever. If you're struggling in this season and you are maybe looking at your family and you're seeing there's patterns, there's generational curses and so on and so forth, I mean one sure way to deal with that is by submitting yourself to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He sets you apart to destroy every yoke. That's what the anointing does. It destroys the yoke. Are you able to identify yokes in your life? The anointing is going to help you. Hallelujah. Finally, the anointing dispels fear. Dispels fear. To dispel is to remove, to do away with completely. The anointing dispels fear. The, 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 the spirit that God has given to us is not a spirit of fear. It is a spirit of power and love and sound mind. It says again in Romans 8 and 15 that we have not received a spirit of fear, but a spirit of the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. When you've been anointed with the Holy Spirit, you have been given the power to dispel fear. Or the anointing itself dispels fear, does away with fear. Some of us are standing in a place where the Lord has called you to do something with your life and you're refusing to move because you are afraid. You don't know how it's going to be. Your question is, as Pastor Paul was leading us, you're asking yourself like Mary, how shall it be? Now, the Bible says, remember when, when, when Mary asked that question, and the angel was bringing the good news about the birth of Jesus Christ. So she asks, how shall it be seeing as I yet do not know a man? What is the answer that the angel gives? He says, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. And the power of the Holy shall overshadow you. When the Lord has anointed you with the Holy Spirit, fear is dealt with. If you're struggling with fear concerning your people, your spouse, your family, your marriage, you're struggling about the future, you're struggling about provision and so on and so forth, about the next move that the Lord is calling you into, consider the anointing. When you receive the anointing, then it deals with fear. Turn to your neighbor, tell them, neighbor, you need the anointing. Turn to another and tell them, neighbor, you need the anointing. If you believe that is true for you, I want you to lift up your voice and just say, Lord, I pray that you will open my eyes to see the areas where I need to be set apart, that I need to be set apart and consecrated, that you would truly anoint me with your Holy Spirit, that I would be able to do the things you're calling me to do. I want to be a beneficiary of the benefits of the anointing. I desire to be fruitful. I desire that the yoke will be destroyed. I desire that fear will be dispelled. I desire to be empowered to thresh the mountains. Without you, I'm not able to do it, but I know that you have pledged your hand of help. You are able to help me. You're able to open me up to the idea of consecration. Lord, I know there are enemies, many enemies to the anointing. One of them at the top of the list is pride. And the thing about pride is that it is so deceptive. Even when I am proud, I am too proud to admit it. Lord, I pray that you will help me by the power of your Holy Spirit today. That you will help me overcome this enemy of the anointing. That I will not sit in my disobedience. When I realize I am wrong, I will not seek to justify it or to legalize it. I will not seek to create a good name for it. I will not seek to look for other people who will make me feel better about the place that I am in. But when I realize I am in disobedience, I will up and ask that you would help me like David. That you would not reject me, oh God. That you would not cast me away from your presence. That you would not take your Holy Spirit from me. That you would restore unto me the joy of your salvation that you would renew a right spirit inside of me. Help me by the power of your Holy Spirit to overcome this enemy of the anointing in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would help me to recall every single time there has been the outward symbol of the anointing, that I would remember that the anointing stays, the anointing preserves, the anointing does not run out, it is not subject to wear and tear. So every time I have been anointed in the past, the anointing is still operational even today. Help me to remember all those times that you have pledged to help me that you have released your empowerment over me in the name of Jesus Christ as I look forward to the anointing today as I look forward to the anointing on Sunday every time as I look forward to the anointing of your Holy Spirit I pray that my spirit will be alive that you will activate my faith to believe that, Lord, you are working at something, something greater than me, something greater than I know, something bigger than I can think, ask, or even imagine, according to the power that works inside of me, your Holy Spirit.
spirit in the name of Jesus Christ rike shata la boza kariando roboza mi preka soko sheke teleberiando roboza kashai lord i pray for every person that is in this house today that is waiting on you to set them apart oh god i pray that they will receive the grace to partner with you in the name of Jesus to partner with you that regardless of the circumstances that come to them their everyday ordinary lives that lord they will not move away oh god that the same principle for the toilet brush we learned about will be operational in their lives that they will not move to the left or to the right whether it is out of convenience or other things that they will not just sit back oh god and cower under pressure that they will not cave into compromise my god but i pray that you would remind them by the power of your holy spirit to stay at their post to remain consecrated and set apart because you have said you will help us oh god help us to receive your help this year to not get out of our post to go and do other things but that we will stay in the place that you've called us to be in the name of jesus help us to be witnesses to be true witnesses of jesus to be real witnesses of you in the name of jesus maybe lift up your voice just a minute longer and just ask the lord to help you to be a witness make that prayer yourself ask the lord god make me a witness you know the areas where you're struggling with your witness maybe it's at the office maybe it's in your home maybe it's in some of the friendships that you have you are a believer and in some of the places you're good but there are some areas where you're not a good witness ask the lord to help you ask the lord to help you ask the lord to help you it says when the holy spirit has come upon you the first thing he will do is he will empower you to be a witness of jesus christ reba kinda ribo shaka talabaz riperdo rubrokoshi kazakaranda rabozi kashate gesa kula mashaka talabaz yandoro roboza there's someone in the house you do not have a problem being a witness everywhere else but when you're by yourself that is the challenge when you're by yourself you're a good witness everywhere else but you do not bear the same witness when you're in your own company receive the empowerment today by the holy spirit receive the empowerment today by the holy spirit to be a witness behind closed doors to be a true follower of jesus christ when you're by yourself in the name of jesus shike tango riba zakayan ripe ripra kuntala bazeke she de kazuka liande ribo zika shanda thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you for every answered prayer in the house today hallelujah Thank you Lord Jesus. Thank you because we learn about your anointing today. And every benefit of the anointing of our previous anointing Lord Jesus, let it be operational in the lives of these loved ones this week in the name of Jesus. That as we look forward to this coming Sunday, we shall come with a deeper revelation because we have been recipients of the great work and the great benefit of the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let this week be different. Let it be marked by the beneficial power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Transform us, Lord Jesus. Cause us to be more like you. More like you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, put your hands together. Celebrate Jesus.